This is section eight of Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Happy Homes and the Hearts That Make Them by Samuel Smiles. Chapter eight. Leaders of Industry, Inventors, and Producers. Read by John Greenman. Who best can suffer best can do. Milton deduct all that men of the humbler classes have done for england in the way of inventions only and see where she would have been but for them arthur helps one of the most strongly marked features of the english-speaking people is their spirit of industry standing out prominent and distinct in their past history and as strikingly characteristic of them now as at any former period it is this spirit which has laid the foundations and built up the industrial greatness of our country this vigorous growth of the nation has been mainly the result of the free energy of individuals and it has been contingent upon the number of hands and minds from time to time actively employed within it whether as cultivators of the soil producers of articles of utility contrivers of tools and machines writers of books or creators of works of art and while this spirit of active industry has been the vital principle of the nation it has also been its saving and remedial one counteracting from time to time the effects of errors in our laws and imperfections in our constitution the career of industry which the nation has pursued has also proved its best education as steady application to work is the healthiest training for every individual so is it the best discipline of a state honorable industry travels the same road with duty and providence has closely linked both with happiness the gods says the poet have placed labor and toil on the way leading to the elysian fields certain it is that no bread eaten by man is so sweet as that earned by his own labor whether bodily or mental by labor the earth has been subdued and man redeemed from barbarism nor has a single step in civilization been made without it labor is not only a necessity and a duty but a blessing only the idler feels it to be a curse the duty of work is written on the thews and muscles of the limbs the mechanisms of the hand the nerves and lobes of the brain the sum of whose healthy action is satisfaction and enjoyment in the school of labor is taught the best practical wisdom it so happens that the history of pottery furnishes some of the most remarkable instances of patient industry and perseverance to be found in the whole range of biography though the art of making common vessels of clay was known to most of the ancient nations that of manufacturing enameled earthenware was much less common it was however practised by the ancient etruscans specimens of whose ware are still to be found in antiquarian collections but it became a lost art and was only recovered at a comparatively recent date the etruscan ware was very valuable in ancient times a vase being worth its weight in gold in the time of augustus the reviver or rediscoverer of the art of enamelling in italy was luca della robbia a florentine sculptor vasari describes him as a man of great perseverance working with his chisel all day and practicing drawing during the greater part of the night he pursued the latter art with so much assiduity that when working late to prevent his feet from freezing with the cold he was accustomed to provide himself with a basket of shavings in which he placed them to keep himself warm and enable him to proceed with his drawings nor says vasari am i the least astonished at this since no man ever becomes distinguished in any art whatsoever who does not early begin to acquire the power of supporting heat cold hunger thirst and 
other discomforts whereas those persons deceive themselves altogether who suppose that when taking their ease and surrounded by all the enjoyments of the world they may still attain to honorable distinction for it is not by sleeping but by waking watching and laboring continually that proficiency is attained and reputation acquired but luca notwithstanding all his application and industry did not succeed in earning enough money by sculpture to enable him to live by the art and the idea occurred to him that he might nevertheless be able to pursue his modeling in some material more facile and less dear than marble hence it was that he began to make his models in clay and to endeavor by experiment so to coat and bake the clay as to render those models durable after many trials he at length discovered a method of covering the clay with a material which when exposed to the intense heat of a furnace became converted into an almost imperishable enamel he afterwards made the further discovery of a method of imparting color to the enamel thus greatly adding to its beauty the fame of luca's work extended throughout europe and specimens of his art became widely diffused many of them were sent into france and spain where they were greatly prized at that time coarse brown jars were almost the only articles of earthenware produced in france and this continued to be the case with comparatively small improvement until the time of palissy a man who toiled and fought against stupendous difficulties with a heroism that sheds a glow almost of romance over the events of his chequered life bernard palissy is supposed to have been born in the south of france about the year fifteen ten his father was probably a worker in glass to which trade bernard was brought up his parents were poor people too poor to give him the benefit of any school education i had no other books said he afterwards than heaven and earth which are open to all he learned however the art of glass painting to which he added that of drawing and afterwards reading and writing when about eighteen years old the glass trade becoming decayed palissy left his father's house with his wallet on his back and went out into the world to search whether there was any place in it for him he first travelled towards gascony working at his trade where he could find employment and occasionally occupying part of his time in land measuring then he travelled northwards sojourning for various periods at different places in france flanders and lower germany thus palissy occupied about ten more years of his life after which he married and ceased from his wanderings settling down to practice glass painting and land measuring at the small town of saint there children were born to him and not only his responsibilities but his expenses increased while do what he could his earnings remained too small for his needs it was therefore necessary for him to bestir himself probably he felt capable of better things than drudging in an employment so precarious as glass painting and hence he was induced to turn his attention to the kindred art of painting and enamelling earthenware yet on this subject he was wholly ignorant for he had never seen earth baked before he began his operations he had therefore everything to learn by himself without any helper but he was full of hope eager to learn of unbounded perseverance and inexhaustible patience it was the sight of an elegant cup of italian manufacture most probably one of luca della robbia's make which first set palissy thinking about the new art a circumstance so apparently insignificant would have produced no effect upon an ordinary mind or even upon palissy himself at an ordinary time but occurring as it did when he was meditating a change of calling he at once became inflamed with the desire of imitating it the sight of this cup disturbed his whole existence and the determination to discover the enamel with which it was glazed thenceforward possessed him like a passion had he been a single man he might have travelled into italy in search of the secret but he was bound to his wife and his children 
and could not leave them so he remained by their side groping in the dark in the hope of finding out the process of making and enamelling earthenware at first he could merely guess the materials of which the enamel was composed and he proceeded to try all manner of experiments to ascertain what they really were he pounded all the substances which he supposed were likely to produce it then he bought common earthen pots broke them into pieces and spreading his compounds over them subjected them to the heat of a furnace which he erected for the purpose of baking them his experiments failed and the results were broken pots and a waste of fuel drugs time and labor women do not readily sympathize with experiments whose only tangible effect is to dissipate the means of buying clothes and food for their children and palissy's wife however dutiful in other respects could not be reconciled to the purchase of more earthen pots which seemed to her to be bought only to be broken yet she must needs submit for palissy had become thoroughly possessed by the determination to master the secret of the enamel and would not let it alone for many successive months and years palissy pursued his experiments the first furnace having proved a failure he proceeded to erect another out of doors there he burnt more wood spoiled more drugs and pots and lost more time until poverty stared him and his family in the face thus said he i fooled away several years with sorrow and sighs because i could not at all arrive at my intention in the intervals of his experiments he occasionally worked at his former callings painting on glass drawing portraits and measuring land but his earnings from these sources were very small at length he was no longer able to carry on his experiments in his own furnace because of the heavy cost of fuels but he bought more potsherds broke them up as before into three or four hundred pieces and covered them with chemicals carried them to a tile-work a league and a half distant from sands there to be baked in an ordinary furnace after the operation he went to see the pieces taken out and to his dismay the whole of the experiments were failures but though disappointed he was not yet defeated for he determined on the very spot to begin afresh his business as a land measurer called him away for a brief season from the pursuit of his experiments in conformity with an edict of the state it became necessary to survey the salt marshes in the neighborhood of sense for the purpose of levying the land tax palissy was employed to make this survey and prepare the requisite map the work occupied him some time and he was doubtless well paid for it but no sooner was it completed than he proceeded with redoubled zeal to follow up his old investigations in the track of the enamels he began by breaking three dozen new earthen pots the pieces of which he covered with different materials which he had compounded and then took them to a neighboring glass furnace to be baked the results gave him a glimmer of hope the greater heat of the glass furnace had melted some of the compounds but though palissy searched diligently for the white enamel he could find none for two more years he went on experimenting without any satisfactory result until the proceeds of his survey of the salt marshes having become nearly spent he was reduced to poverty again but he resolved to make a last great effort and he began by breaking more pots than ever more than three hundred pieces of pottery covered with his compounds were sent to the glass furnace and thither he himself went to watch the results of the baking four hours passed during which he watched and then the furnace was opened the material on one only of the three hundred pieces of potsherd had melted and it was taken out to cool as it hardened it grew white white and polished the piece of potsherd was covered with white enamel described by palissy as singularly beautiful and beautiful it must no doubt have been in his eyes after all his weary waiting he ran home with it to his wife feeling himself as he expressed it quite a new creature but the prize was not yet won far from it the partial success of this intended last effort 
merely had the effect of luring him on to a succession of further experiments and failures in order that he might complete the invention which he now believed to be at hand he resolved to build for himself a glass furnace near his dwelling where he might carry on his operations in secret he proceeded to build the furnace with his own hands carrying the bricks from the brickfield upon his back he was bricklayer laborer and all from seven to eight more months passed at last the furnace was built and ready for use palissy had in the meantime fashioned a number of vessels of clay in readiness for the laying on of the enamel after being subjected to a preliminary process of baking they were covered with the enamel compound and again placed in the furnace for the grand crucial experiment although his means were nearly exhausted palissy had been for some time accumulating a great store of fuel for the final effort and he thought it was enough at last the fire was lit and the operation proceeded all day he sat by the furnace feeding it with fuel he sat there watching and feeding all through the long night but the enamel did not melt the sun rose upon his labors his wife brought him a portion of the scanty morning meal for he would not stir from the furnace into which he continued from time to time to heave more fuel the second day passed and still the enamel did not melt the sun set and another night passed the pale haggard unshorn baffled yet not beaten palissy sat by his furnace eagerly looking for the melting of the enamel a third day and night passed a fourth a fifth and even a sixth yes for six long days and nights did the unconquerable palissy watch and toil fighting against hope and still the enamel would not melt it then occurred to him that there might be some defect in the materials for the enamel perhaps something wanting in the flux so he set to work to pound and compound fresh materials for a new experiment thus two or three more weeks passed but how to buy more pots for those which he had made with his own hands for the purpose of the first experiment were by long baking irretrievably spoiled for the purposes of a second his money was now all spent but he could borrow his character was still good though his wife and the neighbors thought him foolishly wasting his means in futile experiments nevertheless he succeeded he borrowed sufficient from a friend to enable him to buy more fuel and more pots and he was again ready for a further experiment the pots were covered with a new compound placed in the furnace and the fire was again lit it was the last and most desperate experiment of the whole the fire blazed up the heat became intense but still the enamel did not melt the fuel began to run short how to keep up the fire there were the garden palings these would burn they must be sacrificed rather than that the great experiment should fail the garden palings were pulled up and cast into the furnace they were burnt in vain the enamel had not yet melted ten minutes more heat might do it fuel must be had at whatever cost there remained the household furniture and shelving a crashing noise was heard in the house and amidst the screams of his wife and children who now feared palissy's reason was giving way the tables were seized broken up and heaved into the furnace the enamel had not melted yet there remained the shelving another noise of the wrenching of timber was heard within the house and the shelves were torn down and hurled after the furniture into the fire wife and children then rushed from the house and went frantically through the town calling out that poor palissy had gone mad and was breaking up his very furniture for firewood for an entire month his shirt had not been off his back and he was utterly worn out wasted with toil anxiety watching and want of food he was in debt and seemed on the verge of ruin but he had at length mastered the secret for the last great burst of heat had melted the enamel the common brown household jars when taken out of the furnace after it had become cool were found covered with a white glaze for this he could endure reproach contumely and scorn 
and wait patiently for the opportunity of putting his discovery into practice as better days came round palissy next hired a potter to make some earthen vessels after the designs which he furnished while he himself proceeded to model some medallions in clay for the purpose of enamelling them but how to maintain himself and his family until the wares were made and ready for sale fortunately there remained one man in saint who still believed in the integrity if not the judgment of palissy an innkeeper who agreed to feed and lodge him for six months while he went on with his manufacture as for the working potter whom he had hired palissy soon found that he could not pay him the stipulated wages having already stripped his dwelling he could but strip himself and he accordingly parted with some of his clothes to the potter in part payment of the wages which he owed him palissy next erected an improved furnace but he was so unfortunate as to build part of the inside with flints when it was heated these flints cracked and burst and the spinculi were scattered over the pieces of pottery sticking to them though the enamel came out right the work was irretrievably spoilt and thus six more months labor was lost persons were found willing to buy the articles at a low price notwithstanding the injury they had sustained but palissy would not sell them considering that to have done so would be to decry and abase his honor and so he broke in pieces the entire batch nevertheless says he hope continued to inspire me and i held on manfully sometimes when visitors called i entertained them with pleasantry while i was really sad at heart at this stage of his affairs palissy became melancholy and almost hopeless and seems to have all but broken down he wandered gloomily about the fields near saint his clothes hanging in tatters and himself worn to a skeleton in a curious passage in his writings he describes how the calves of his legs had disappeared and were no longer able with the help of garters to hold up his stockings which fell about his heels when he walked the family continued to reproach him for his recklessness and his neighbors cried shame upon him for his obstinate folly so he returned for a time to his former calling and after a year's diligent labor during which he earned bread for his household and somewhat recovered his character among his neighbors he again resumed his darling enterprise but though he had already spent about ten years in the search for the enamel it cost him nearly eight more years of experimental plodding before he perfected his invention he gradually learnt dexterity and certainty of result by experience gathering practical knowledge out of many failures every mishap was a fresh lesson to him teaching him something new about the nature of enamels the qualities of argillaceous earths the tempering of clays and the construction and management of furnaces at last after about sixteen years labor palissy took heart and called himself potter these sixteen years had been his term of apprenticeship to the art during which he had wholly to teach himself beginning at the very beginning he was now able to sell his wares and thereby maintain his family in comfort but he never rested satisfied with what he had accomplished he proceeded from one step of improvement to another always aiming at the greatest perfection possible he studied natural objects for patterns and with such success that the great buffon spoke of him as so great a naturalist as nature only can produce his ornamental pieces are now regarded as rare gems and sell at almost fabulous prices the ornaments on them are for the most part accurate models from life of wild animals lizards and plants found in the fields about science and tastefully combined as ornaments into the texture of a plate or a vase we have not however come to an end of the sufferings of palissy respecting which a few words remain to be said being a protestant at a time when religious persecution waxed hot in the south of france and expressing his views without fear he was regarded as a dangerous heretic his enemies having informed against him 
his house at Saint was entered by the officers of justice, and his workshop was thrown open to the rabble, who entered and smashed his pottery, while he himself was hurried off by night and cast into a dungeon at Bordeaux to wait his turn at the stake or the scaffold. He was condemned to be burnt, but a powerful noble, the constable de Montmorency, interposed to save his life not because he had any special regard for palissy or his religion but because no other artist could be found capable of executing the enamelled pavement for his magnificent dwelling then in course of erection at ecois near paris he was liberated and returned to his home at saint only to find it devastated and broken up his workshop was open to the sky and his works lay in ruins shaking the dust of saint from his feet he left the place never to return to it and removed to paris to carry on the works ordered of him by the constable and the queen mother besides carrying on the manufacture of pottery with the aid of his two sons palissy during the latter part of his life wrote and published several books on the potter's art with a view to the instruction of his countrymen and in order that they might avoid the many mistakes which he himself had made he also wrote on agriculture on fortification and natural history on which latter subject he even delivered lectures to a limited number of persons he waged war against astrology alchemy witchcraft and like impostures this stirred up against him many enemies who pointed the finger at him as a heretic and he was again arrested for his religion and imprisoned in the bastille he was now an old man of seventy-eight trembling on the verge of the grave but his spirit was as brave as ever he was threatened with death unless he recanted but he was as obstinate in holding to his religion as he had been in hunting out the secret of the enamel the king henry the third even went to see him in prison to induce him to abjure his faith my good man said the king you have now served my mother and myself for forty-five years we have put up with your adhering to your religion amidst fires and massacres now i am so pressed by the guise party as well as by my own people that i am constrained to leave you in the hands of your enemies and to-morrow you will be burnt unless you become converted sire answered the unconquerable old man i am ready to give my life for the glory of god you have said many times that you have pity on me and now i have pity on you who have pronounced the words i am constrained it is not spoken like a king it is what you and those who constrain you can never effect upon me for i know how to die palissy did indeed die shortly after a martyr though not at the stake he died in the bastille after enduring about a year's imprisonment there peacefully terminating a life distinguished for heroic labor extraordinary endurance inflexible rectitude and the exhibition of many rare and noble virtues the career of josiah wedgwood the english potter was less checkered and more prosperous than that of palissy and his lot was cast in happier times down to the middle of last century england was behind most other nations of the first order in europe in respect of skilled industry although there were many potters in staffordshire their productions were of the rudest kind for the most part only plain brownware with the patterns scratched in while the clay was wet josiah wedgwood was one of those industrious men who from time to time spring from the ranks of the common people and by their energetic character not only practically educate the working population in habits of industry but by the example of diligence and perseverance which they set before them largely influence the public activity in all directions and contribute in a great degree to form the national character he was like arkwright the youngest of a family of thirteen children his grandfather and granduncle were both potters as was also his father who died when he was a mere boy leaving him a patrimony of twenty pounds he had learned to read and write at the village school but on the death of his father he was taken from it and set to work as a thrower 
in a small pottery carried on by his elder brother there he began life his working life to use his own words at the lowest round of the ladder when only eleven years old he was shortly after seized by an attack of virulent smallpox from the effects of which he suffered during the rest of his life for it was followed by a disease in the right knee which recurred at frequent intervals and was only got rid of by the amputation of the limb many years later when he had completed his apprenticeship with his brother josiah joined partnership with another workman and carried on a small business in making knife hafts boxes and sundry articles for domestic use but he made comparatively little progress until he began business on his own account at burslem there he diligently pursued his calling introducing new articles to the trade and gradually extending his business what he chiefly aimed at was to manufacture cream-colored ware of a better quality than was then produced in staffordshire as regarded shape color glaze and durability to understand the subject thoroughly he devoted his leisure to the study of chemistry and he made numerous experiments on fluxes glazes and various sorts of clay being a close inquirer and accurate observer he noticed that a certain earth containing silica which was black before calcination became white after exposure to the heat of a furnace this fact observed and pondered on led to the idea of mixing silica with the red powder of the potteries and to the discovery that the mixture becomes white when calcined he had but to cover this material with a vitrefaction of transparent glaze to obtain one of the most important products of fictile art that which under the name of english earthenware was to attain the greatest commercial value and become the most extensive utility wedgwood was for some time much troubled by his furnaces though nothing like to the same extent that palissy was and he overcame his difficulties in the same way by repeated experiments and unfaltering perseverance his first attempts at making porcelain for table use were a succession of disastrous failures the labors of months being often destroyed in a day it was only after a long series of trials in the course of which he lost time money and labor that he arrived at the proper sort of glaze to be used but he would not be denied and at last he conquered success through patience the improvement of pottery became his passion and was never lost sight of for a moment even when he had mastered his difficulties and become a prosperous man manufacturing white stoneware and cream-colored ware in large quantities for home and foreign use he went forward perfecting his manufactures until his example extending in all directions the actions of the entire district were stimulated and a great branch of british industry was eventually established on firm foundations he aimed throughout at the highest excellence declaring his determination to give over manufacturing any article whatsoever it might be rather than to degrade it wedgwood called to his aid the crucible of the chemist the knowledge of the antiquary and the skill of the artist he found out flaxman when a youth and while he liberally nurtured his genius drew from him a large number of beautiful designs for his pottery and porcelain converting them by his manufacture into objects of taste and excellence and thus making them instrumental in the diffusion of art among the people by careful experiment and study he was even enabled to rediscover the art of painting on porcelain or earthenware vases and similar articles an art practised by the ancient etruscans but which had been lost since the time of pliny the result of wedgwood's labors was that the manufacture of pottery which he found in the very lowest condition became one of the staples of england and instead of importing what we needed for home use from abroad england became a large exporter to other countries supplying them with earthenware even in the face of enormous prohibitory duties on articles of british produce wedgwood gave evidence as to his manufacture before parliament in seventeen eighty five only some thirty years after he had begun his operations 
from which it appeared that instead of providing only casual employment to a small number of inefficient and badly remunerated workmen about twenty thousand persons then derived their bread directly from the manufacture of earthenware without taking into account the increased numbers to which it gave employment in coal mines and in the carrying trade by land and sea and the stimulus which it gave to employment in many ways in various parts of the country yet important as had been the advances made in his time mr wedgwood was of the opinion that the manufacture was but in its infancy and that the improvements which he had effected were but of small moment compared with those to which the art was capable of attaining through the continued industry and growing intelligence of the manufacturers and the natural facilities and political advantages enjoyed by great britain an opinion which has been fully borne out by the progress which has since been effected in this important branch of industry in eighteen fifty two not fewer than eighty-four million pieces of pottery were exported from england to other countries besides what were made for home use but it is not merely the quantity and value of the produce that is entitled to consideration but the improvement of the condition of the population by whom this great branch of industry is conducted when wedgwood began his labors the staffordshire district was only in a half civilized state the people were poor uncultivated and few in number when wedgwood's manufacture was firmly established there was found ample employment at good wages for three times the number of population while their moral advancement had kept pace with their material improvement men such as these are fairly entitled to take rank as the industrial heroes of the civilized world their patient self-reliance amidst trials and difficulties their courage and perseverance in the pursuit of worthy objects are not less heroic than the bravery and devotion of the soldier and the sailor one of the first grand results of watt's invention which placed an almost unlimited power at the command of the producing classes was the establishment of the cotton manufacture the person most closely identified with the foundation of this great branch of industry was unquestionably sir richard arkwright whose practical energy and sagacity were perhaps even more remarkable than his mechanical inventiveness arkwright like most of our great mechanicians sprang from the ranks he was born in preston in seventeen thirty two his parents were very poor and he was the youngest of thirteen children he was never at school the only education he received he gave to himself and to the last he was only able to write with difficulty when a boy he was apprenticed to a barber and after learning the business he set up for himself in bolton where he occupied an underground cellar over which he put up the sign come to the subterraneous barber he shaves for a penny the other barbers found their customers leaving them and reduced their prices to his standard when arkwright determined to push his trade announced his determination to give a clean shave for a half a penny after a few years he quitted his cellar and became an itinerant dealer in hair at that time wigs were worn and wig making formed an important branch of the barbering business arkwright went about buying hair for the wigs he was accustomed to attend the hiring fairs throughout lancashire resorted to by young women for the purpose of securing their long tresses and it is said that in negotiations of this sort he was very successful he also dealt in a chemical hair dye which he used adroitly and thereby secured a considerable trade but he does not seem notwithstanding his pushing character to have done more than earn a bare living the fashion of wig wearing having undergone a change distress fell upon the wig makers and arkwright being of a mechanical turn was consequently induced to turn machine inventor or conjurer as the pursuit was then popularly termed many attempts were made about that time to invent a spinning machine and our barber determined to launch his little bark on the sea of invention with the rest like other self-taught men of the same bias he had already been devoting his spare time to the invention of a perpetual motion machine and from that the transition to a spinning machine was easy 
he followed his experiments so assiduously that he neglected his business lost the little money he had saved and was reduced to great poverty his wife for he had by this time married was impatient at what she conceived to be a wanton waste of time and money and in a moment of sudden wrath she seized upon and destroyed his models hoping thus to remove the cause of the family privations arkwright was a stubborn and enthusiastic man and he was provoked beyond measure by this conduct of his wife from whom he immediately separated in traveling about the country arkwright had become acquainted with a person named k a clockmaker at warrington who assisted him in constructing some of the parts of his perpetual motion machinery it is supposed that he was informed by k of the principle of spinning by rollers but it is also said that the idea was first suggested to him by accidentally observing a red-hot piece of iron become elongated by passing through iron rollers however this may be the idea at once took firm possession of his mind and he proceeded to devise the process by which it was to be accomplished arkwright now abandoned his business of hair collecting and devoted himself to the perfecting of his machine a model of which constructed by k under his directions he set up in the parlor of the free grammar school at preston being a burgess of the town he voted at the contested election at which general burgoyne was returned but such was his poverty and such the tattered state of his dress that a number of persons subscribed a sum sufficient to have him put in a state fit to appear in the poll-room the exhibition of his machine in a town where so many workpeople lived by the exercise of manual labor proved a dangerous experiment ominous growlings were heard outside the schoolroom from time to time and arkwright remembering the fate of k who was mobbed and compelled to fly from lancaster because of his invention of the fly shuttle and of poor hargreaves whose spinning jenny had been pulled to pieces only a short time before by a blackburn mob wisely determined on packing up his model and removing to a less dangerous locality he went accordingly to nottingham where he applied to some of the local bankers for pecuniary assistance and the messrs wright consented to advance him a sum of money on condition of sharing in the profits of the invention the machine however not being perfected so soon as they had anticipated the bankers recommended arkwright to apply to messrs strutt and need the former of whom was the ingenious inventor and patentee of the stocking frame mr strutt at once appreciated the merits of the invention and a partnership was entered into with arkwright whose road to fortune was now clear the patent was secured in the name of richard arkwright of nottingham clockmaker and it is a circumstance worthy of note that it was taken out in seventeen sixty nine the same year in which watt secured the patent for his steam engine a cotton mill was first erected at nottingham driven by horses and another was shortly after built on a much larger scale turned by a water wheel from which circumstance the spinning machine came to be called the water frame arkwright's labors however were comparatively speaking only begun he had still to perfect all the working details of his machine it was in his hands the subject of constant modification and improvement until eventually it was rendered practicable and profitable in an eminent degree but success was only secured by long and patient labor for some years indeed the speculation was disheartening and unprofitable swallowing up a very large amount of capital without any result when success began to appear more certain then the lancashire manufacturers fell upon arkwright's patent to pull it in pieces as the cornish miners fell upon bolton and watt to rob them of the profits of their steam engine arkwright was even denounced as the enemy of the working people and a mill which he built near chorley was destroyed by a mob in the presence of a strong force of police and military the lancashire men refused to buy his materials though they were confessedly the best in the market then they refused to pay patent right for the use of his machine and combined to crush him in the courts of law to the disgust of right-minded people arkwright's patent was upset after the trial 
when passing the hotel at which his opponents were staying one of them said loud enough to be heard by him well we've done the old shaver at last to which he coolly replied never mind i've a razor left that will shave you all he established new mills in lancashire derbyshire and new lanark in scotland the mills of crumfort also came into his hands at the expiration of his partnership with strutt and the amount of the excellence of his products were such that in a short time he obtained so complete a control of the trade that the prices were fixed by him and he governed the main operations of the other cotton spinners arkwright was a man of great force of character indomitable courage much worldly shrewdness with a business faculty almost amounting to genius at one period his time was engrossed by severe and continuous labor occasioned by the organizing and conducting of his numerous manufactories sometimes from four in the morning till nine at night at fifty years of age he set to work to learn english grammar and improve himself in writing and orthography after overcoming every obstacle he had the satisfaction of reaping the reward of his enterprise eighteen years after he had constructed his first machine he rose to such estimation in derbyshire that he was appointed high sheriff of the county and shortly after george the third conferred upon him the honor of knighthood he died in seventeen ninety two arkwright was the founder of the modern factory system a branch of industry which has unquestionably proved a source of immense wealth to individuals and to the nation among other distinguished founders of industry the rev william lee inventor of the stocking frame and john heathcote inventor of the bobbin net machine are worthy of notice as men of great mechanical skill and perseverance through whose labors a vast amount of remunerative employment has been provided william lee was born about the year fifteen sixty three he was a poor scholar and had to struggle with poverty from his earliest years at the time when lee invented the stocking frame he was officiating as curate of calverton near nottingham and it is alleged that being married and poor his wife was under the necessity of contributing to their joint support by knitting and that lee while watching the motion of his wife's fingers conceived the idea of imitating their movements by a machine for three years he devoted himself to the prosecution of the invention sacrificing everything to his new idea as the prospect of success opened before him he abandoned his curacy and devoted himself to the art of stocking making by machinery whatever may have been the actual facts as to the origin of the invention of the stocking loom there can be no doubt as to the extraordinary mechanical genius displayed by its inventor that a clergyman living in a remote village whose life had for the most part been spent with books should contrive a machine of such delicate and complicated movements and at once advance the art of knitting from the tedious process of linking threads in a chain of loops by three needles in the fingers of a woman to the beautiful and rapid process of weaving by the stocking frame was indeed an astonishing achievement which may be pronounced almost unequalled in the history of mechanical invention lee's merit was all the greater as the handicraft art were then in their infancy and little attention had as yet been given to the contrivance of machinery for the purposes of manufacture he was under the necessity of extemporizing the parts of his machine as he best could and adopting various expedients to overcome difficulties as they arose his tools were imperfect and his materials were imperfect and he had no skilled workmen to assist him the first frame he made was a twelve gauge without lead sinkers and it was almost wholly of wood the needles being also stuck in bits of wood one of lee's principal difficulties consisted in the formation of the stitch for want of needle eyes but this he eventually overcame by forming eyes to the needles with a three square file at length one difficulty after another was successfully overcome and after three years labor the machine was sufficiently complete to be fit for use the quondam curate full of enthusiasm for his art now began stocking weaving in the village of calverton and he continued to work there for several years instructing his brother james 
and several of his relations in the practice of the art having brought his frame to a considerable degree of perfection and being desirous of securing the patronage of queen elizabeth whose partiality for knitted silk stockings was well known lee proceeded to london to exhibit the loom before her majesty he first showed it to several members of the court and was through their instrumentality at length admitted to an interview with the queen and worked the machine in her presence elizabeth however did not give him the encouragement that he had expected and she is said to have opposed the invention on the ground that it was calculated to deprive a large number of poor people of their employment of hand knitting lee was no more successful in finding other patrons and considering himself and his invention treated with contempt he embraced the offer made to him by sully the sagacious minister of henry the fourth to proceed to rouen and instruct the operatives of that town in the construction and use of the stocking frame lee accordingly transferred himself and his machines to france in sixteen o five taking with him his brother and seven workmen he met with a cordial reception at rouen and was proceeding with the manufacture of stockings on a large scale when unhappily misfortune again overtook him henry the fourth his protector on whom he relied for the rewards honors and promised grant of privileges which had induced lee to settle in france was murdered by the fanatic ravaillac and the encouragement and protection which had heretofore been extended to him were at once withdrawn to press his claims at court lee proceeded to paris but being a protestant as well as a foreigner his representations were treated with neglect and worn out with vexation and grief this distinguished inventor shortly after died at paris in a state of extreme poverty and distress lee's brother with seven of the workmen succeeded in escaping from france with their frames leaving two behind on james lee's return to nottinghamshire he was joined by one ashton a miller of thornton who had been instructed in the art of framework knitting by the inventor himself before he left england these two with the workmen and their frames began the stocking manufacture at thornton and carried it on with considerable success the place was favorably situated for the purpose as the sheep pastured in the neighboring district of sherwood yielded a kind of wool of the longest staple the number of looms employed in different parts of england gradually increased and the machine manufacture of stockings eventually became an important branch of the national industry john heathcote was the son of a cottage farmer at long walton leicestershire where he was born in seventeen eighty four he was taught to read and write at the village school but was shortly removed from it to be put apprentice to a framesmith in a neighboring village the boy soon learnt to handle tools with dexterity and he acquired a minute knowledge of the parts of which the stocking frame was composed as well as of the more intricate warp machine at his leisure he studied how to introduce improvements in them and his friend mr baisley m p states that as early as the age of sixteen he conceived the idea of inventing a machine by which lace might be made similar to buckingham or french lace then all made by hand the first practical improvement he succeeded in introducing was in the warp frame when by means of an ingenious apparatus he succeeded in producing mitts of a lacy appearance and it was this success which determined him to pursue the study of mechanical lace-making when a little over twenty-one years of age heathcote married and went to nottingham in search of work he then found employment as a smith and setter up of hosiery and warp frames he also continued to pursue the subject on which his mind had before been occupied it was a long and laborious task requiring the exercise of great perseverance and no little ingenuity his master elliot described him at that time as plodding patient self-denying and taciturn undaunted by failures and mistakes full of resources and expedients and entertaining the most perfect confidence that his application of mechanical principles would eventually be crowned with success during this time his wife was kept in almost as great anxiety as himself 
she well knew of his struggles and difficulties and she began to feel the pressure of poverty on her household for while he was laboring at his invention he was frequently under the necessity of laying aside the work that brought in the weekly wages many years after when all difficulties had been successfully overcome the conversation which took place between husband and wife one eventful saturday evening was vividly remembered well john said the anxious wife looking in her husband's face will it work no anne was the sad answer i have had to take it all in pieces again though he could still speak hopefully and cheerfully his poor wife could restrain her feelings no longer but sat down and cried bitterly she had however only a few more weeks to wait for success long labored for and richly deserved came at last and a proud and happy man was john heathcote when he brought home the first narrow strip of bobbin net made by his machine and placed it in the hands of his wife it is difficult to describe in words an invention so complicated as the bobbin net machine it was indeed a mechanical pillow for making lace imitating in an ingenious manner the motions of the lace-maker's fingers in intersecting or tying the meshes of the lace upon her pillow long after he said the single difficulty of getting the diagonal threads to twist in the allotted space was so great that if it had now to be done i should probably not attempt its accomplishment at the age of twenty-four he was enabled to secure his invention by a patent as in the case of nearly all inventions which have proved productive heathcote's rights as a patentee were disputed and his claims as an inventor called in question on the supposed invalidity of the patent the lace-makers boldly adopted the bobbin net machine and set the inventor at defiance but other patents were taken out for alleged improvements and adaptations and it was only when these new patentees fell out and went to law with each other that heathcote's rights became established one lace manufacturer having brought an action against another for an alleged infringement of his patent the jury brought in a verdict for the defendant in which the judge concurred on the ground that both the machines in question were infringements of heathcote's patent after the trial was over mr heathcote on inquiry found about six hundred machines at work after his patent and he proceeded to levy royalty upon the owners of them which amounted to a large sum but the profits realized by the manufacturers of lace were very great and the use of the machines rapidly extended while the price of the article was reduced from five pounds the square yard to about five pence in the course of twenty-five years during the same period the average annual returns of the lace trade have been at least four millions sterling and it gives remunerative employment to about a hundred and fifty thousand workpeople in eighteen o nine we find him established as a lace manufacturer at loughborough in leicestershire there he carried on a prosperous business giving employment to a large number of operatives at wages varying from twenty five dollars to fifty dollars a week not only did he carry on the manufacture of lace but the various branches of business connected with it yarn doubling silk spinning net making and finishing he also established an iron foundry and works for the manufacture of agricultural implements which proved of great convenience to the district it was a favorite idea of his that steam power was capable of being applied to perform all the heavy drudgery of life and he labored for a long time at the invention of a steam plough in eighteen thirty two he so far completed his invention as to be enabled to take out a patent for it and heathcote's steam plough though it has since been superseded by fowler's was considered the best machine of the kind that had up to that time been invented mr heathcote was a man of great natural gifts he possessed a sound understanding quick perception and a genius for business of the highest order with these he combined uprightness honesty and integrity qualities which are the true glory of human character himself a diligent self-educator he gave ready encouragement to deserving youths in his employment stimulating their talents and fostering their energies during his own busy life 
he contrived to save time to master french and italian of which he acquired an accurate and grammatical knowledge his mind was largely stored with the results of a careful study of the best literature and there was few subjects on which he had not formed for himself shrewd and accurate views the two thousand workpeople in his employment regarded him almost as a father and he carefully provided for their comfort and improvement prosperity did not spoil him as it does so many nor close his heart against the claims of the poor and struggling who were always sure of his sympathy and help to provide for the education of the children of his workpeople he built schools for them at the cost of about thirty thousand dollars he was also a man of singularly cheerful and buoyant disposition a favorite with men of all classes and most admired and beloved by those who knew him best in eighteen thirty one the electors of tiverton of which town mr heathcote had proved himself so genuine a benefactor returned him to represent them in parliament and he continued their member for nearly thirty years during a great part of that time he had lord palmerston for his colleague and the noble lord on more than one public occasion expressed the high regard which he entertained for his venerable friend on retiring from the representation in eighteen fifty nine thirteen hundred of his workmen presented him with a silver inkstand and gold pen in token of their esteem he enjoyed his leisure for only two more years dying in january eighteen sixty one at the age of seventy seven and leaving behind him a character for probity virtue manliness and mechanical genius of which his descendants may well be proud End of chapter eight leaders of industry inventors and producers read by john greenman